Yes, you are. Thank you, ma'am. A very warm good morning to everyone. I'm Leah, welcoming you all to this webinar on the topic, Women in Indian History, Emerging Perspectives, by, uh, by respected Professor Jaya Tyagi, organized by Women Development Cell, Atmaram Sanatan Dharma College, University of Delhi. The world is full of diamonds and gems, and we are having some of them here today to build this event. On this note, I would like to give my cordial reception to our speaker, Professor Jayatyagi, Department of History, Principal Sir, Professor Jyantosh Kumar Jha, respected teachers, and my fellow participants. Before we get started, if you have any questions during the talk, I request you all to please type them in the chat box, if we, uh, which we will bring, bring up them at the end of the talk. And one another important information that a feedback form will be posted in the chat box in between, and you all are requested to fill the feedback form. Now, uh, I request our Honorable Principal Sir to forward a few words. Sir, please. Thank you. Honorable Professor Jaya S. Tyagi Ji, uh, today's speaker for this webinar, Dr. Sibani Fukan, convener, Women Development Cell of the College, members of the cell, Dr. Sayyad Mubin Jehra, Dr. Nidhi Dureja, Dr. Manisa, and others. Uh, my dear student, it's an honor to welcome Professor Jaya Tyagi in this webinar. Listening her is a pleasure always. I have heard her lecture uh, earlier also. I am grateful that she has given her valuable time to deliver a lecture on the very important and pertinent topic, women in Indian history, emerging perspectives. So it is a great uh, thing for the students who have opted uh, these papers in GE and in the English discipline also. So Women Development Cell of our college is organizing these kind of webinars, workshops, talks regularly. And these kind of awareness program is very necessary and required for the time also. In fact, a madam would be surprised to know that whenever uh, we organize the programs, uh, our boy students are more participants in these kind of programs <laughs> rather than girls' students. So it's a pleasure thing. And in fact, so happy. Yeah, Good. yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure. Kudos for the ARST boys then and the girls. So uh, my best wishes to the organizers, and I expect and hope that these kind of programs will uh, be coming in future also. So once again, uh, I welcome Madam uh, on behalf of my college and my team. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Over you. to Sibani. Thank you so much for taking time out and being here, sir. And of course, we will hope to organize many such programs with, with all your support. I think it becomes quite easy. So we hope to organize many such programs. And I would sort of also thank Mobin for you know getting in touch with Professor Tyagi and making this possible. Uh, over to Laya. I think you can uh, take over, Laya. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now I request Dr. Nidhi Dureja, ma'am, to introduce our speaker, Professor Jaya Tyagi, ma'am. Ma'am, please. Yeah, uh, very good morning, ma'am, and it's an honor for me to introduce you to the, uh, to the uh, participant. Uh, Professor Jaya Tyagi has been teaching history at the Department of History, University of Delhi, for past 34 years. She is also director of Women's Studies and Development Center for Advanced Studies, WSDC, in the university. She has done postdoc from Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla, and also a course in historical linguistics from Harvard University, Cambridge, and Massachusetts. Her area of specialization include ancient Indian history, social history, gender studies, studies on households, religion, rights as well as rituals and their social context. 
she has published the monographs entitled Contestation and Compliance, Retrieving Women's Agen Agency for Puranic Traditions, published by Oxford University Press, and the second one, Engendering the Early Indian Household, Brahmanical Precepts in the Grey Sutras. This was published by Orient Longman Publisher. She has also co-edited a volume on Indian history and culture in both the languages, English and Hindi, published by Ratna Sagar and University of Delhi. She has written several articles in peer-reviewed journals and chapters in edited volumes. As director of WSDC since 2015, she has spearheaded the center into being given the status of a UGC-recognized Center for Advanced Studies. The center has an interdisciplinary orientation and undertakes activities related to research on gender and intersectionality. And it is also involved in the capacity building and training of research scholars and teachers while also being actively engaged in community outreach and gender sensitization. She has also chaired the internal complaint committee of University of Delhi and spoken in several international and national seminars and workshops and conducted programs for gender sensitization in government, private and educational organization. So with these words, I again welcome you with folded, hand, folded hands, ma'am, and uh, will <clears throat> ask for your, uh, for your uh, presentation, ma'am. Oh, thank you so much uh, for those very kind words which pr uh, Principal Jha spoke for me and uh, Dr. Dureja spoke for me. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to come to ARSD and uh, interact with the faculty and students here. I know you're doing a very good job and I'd like to compliment the principal, the Women's Development Center, CEL, and also all the students, because the students being the primary stakeholders, they are our you know, uh, focus of interest. And if the, it's the students who make the institution. So it's so good to interact with colleagues and students of ARST, and I want to thank you again. Now, uh, I'm going to, uh, I have a presentation and I'll go through it, uh, but at any point, if somebody, wants to sort of, you know, engage or interact with a particular point, then please uh, um, let me know. Uh, when Alvin uh, contacted me, I had uh, something else in mind and, you know, we kept talking about, you know, going to and forth about what I should speak on. And finally, we settled on this. Um, why I say emerging perspectives is because uh, women are not a homogeneous category. Women uh, have constantly been negotiating in dynamic social, economic, political contexts. And so whenever we talk about women in, in Indian history, particularly, we cannot separate them from the context that they live in and isolate them. And that is the primary you know, uh, objective of any studies on women, to contextualize them and to see how women respond to their environment and how the environment response to them. So that's, you know, we start off with that, that there is, uh, women are not a homogeneous category. When we talk of women in history, we should be talking about histories and multitude of experiences. And also recognize that how we have to be very tentative. We cannot, I mean, if somebody asks you today that what do you think of women in contemporary society, there'll be thousand interpretations. So that is so much more difficult for history because when you go back in history, you're depending on sources. Uh, we have very few sources. So, you know, it's like that famous story which 
I think Ramanujan also talks about A.K. Ramanujan and others that, you know, you uh, throw the, wherever there is light, then you just think that that is what is lit up. So that is what it was. But what is lit up is just one aspect of what we know. There's so much which is still, uh, you know, there's so much to retrieve. And so the process of retrieval of history is as important. So once we start with that premise, uh, we also need to understand that rather than just talk about women's studies, and uh, women, you know, even this whole word women's development may have been relevant in the 80s, but I find it a very patronizing term now because uh, it's not as if, you know, somebody else is developing women. And the whole notion of how women are involved in processes that happen to them. So rather than just focus on women's studies, we also need to talk about gender studies where women, men, transgender, and then whole, you know, I mean, where we are discussing LGBTQI, we're discussing femininity, we're discussing masculinity. And way back in 1975, Natalie Zimon Davis had said that we need to study history of both men and women, because you cannot isolate women and just study. So, you know, there was this period in women's studies where we had this you know, focus on women because there wasn't so much focus on um, women earlier. But now this whole notion of just talking about women is not, you know, it won't give us a complete um, construct of what happened in history. And that is why I'm quoting Joan Scott when I say, gender is a primary way of signifying relations of power. So it's only when you discuss, you know, you cannot discuss women and not discuss the hold people have over certain women or the hold that women have over other categories. So gender becomes implicated in the construction of power itself and how it is conceptualized. So once you understand that gender and power are interlinked and that it is the way relations of power work out, then it helps us understand the complex connections amongst different types of human interaction, how human beings interact with each other. And that doesn't mean men vis-a-vis -vis women or that we are you know, talking about all these antagonisms or whatever. It talks about every kind of social relationship, men and men, women and women, men and women, and all the other categories that we can also include, include in this. And the other thing that I want to start off with is that this, again, this is something that Joan Scott says, and I'll keep going back to Joan Scott, uh, because uh, to a certain extent, uh, I have adopted her methodology. It is that you need to replace the fact that power is unified, coherent, and centralized. Aapko ye lag raha hoga ki shakti ko ek jagah se ubhar ke aa rahi hai. Aisa nahi hai. Na wo ek ek krit hai, na susangat hai, na hi ek kendra se ubhar ke aa rahi hai. Power is discursive and that is why uh, you know, the whole notion of Foucault's concept of power, that in the household, power relations are different. In politics, there are power relations. Every aspect of social relationship has a power relation, and we have to understand it. So this whole notion of power relations, domination, and subordination also the na nature in which discursive, uh, how discursive power is, that it is constituted in different social fields of force. Ki alag alag jage aapko alag tarike se shakti ke prateek milenge. And that power, this is something that Foucault had said, that power is embodied in discourse, knowledge, and regimes of truth. What is knowledge? itself is something which changes over a period of time. So if we talk about the Vedic period, knowledge is a knowledge of the Vedas. 
of the Vedic hymns. So how can you say women were educated at that time when the notion of education itself is very different? So knowledge, what is embodied in discourse, how knowledge, discursive knowledge is, and how they belong to regimes of truth. And then, of course, before I start off with Indian history, also the notion of, uh, you know, how Judith Butler refers to gender and sexuality and how she says all of these are a reflection of heterosexual desire, which is, uh, you know, seen as the norm. Male and female relations are seen as the norm. And she says that feminists also promote this duality this, uh, you know, femininity and masculinity, and there is need to move beyond that. On one end of the spectrum uh, can be masculinity, on one end can be femininity, but gender is a spectrum. And you have to talk about how individuals perceive themselves. And then this whole notion of identity, that how you link uh, gender with class and then in the Indian context, of course, caste and jati and all also come in it, region, ethnicity, race, and many. So, you know, being a woman is one aspect of one's identity. That when you talk about intersectionality, then class, region, ethnicity, language, everything, are, there are other identities also which then that is why we start off with saying that women are not a homogeneous category. And what is very interesting is how Judith Butler does not agree that sex is biological and gender is constructed. You know, so earlier we used to start off with this that gender is socially constructed and sex is biological. She says sex and gender are both constructed. And that also this notion that subject and object binary that we keep, that also is faulty, that women as subjects and not as objects is a construct and we have to move beyond that. And what Butler is saying is that gender is performative. And gender is experience. Ki kya aap anubhav karte so this whole notion of how gender is something which is performative. It is experience. And you cannot even the fact that you have this notion of body and its functions, that itself is a construct. Ki aap sharir ko kis tarike se dekhte hai, aur fir uske kya kya kare hai, uska bhi ek dharna hai, jo nirman kya gaya. Asal mein gender wo hai jo aap mehsoos karte hai aur jo pradarshit, kis tarike se usko aap pradarshit karte hai. And so uh, when you talk about Joan Scott, she says that gender is the, as I've been telling you, the constitutive element of social relations based on perceived differences between the sexes. Kya aap sochte hai ki langik antar hai. Wo fir samajik sambandh ko aap fir usi tarike se dekhenge. She says it's a primary way of signifying relationships of power. But she also says that whenever you talk about women, you have to keep in mind the concept of human agency. Everybody, every human being, whether it's men or women, want to construct an identity, a life, a set of relationships. So you cannot just say that uh, uh, you cannot separate, separate agency from women. But she also says that language sets boundaries and also, you know, uh, it holds within it because it, this is something that Foucault also had said that wherever there is power, there is resistance. So, jahan bhi shakti ko koi havi hona chahega, waha pe sangharsh bhi hoga. So, if power is discursive, then resistance also will be discursive. So, you have to give women that 
uh, you have to understand gender history from the point of view of the fact that women have agency, even if it's restricted, they are always a possibilities for negation, resistance. So, ये जो महिलाओं का संघर्ष है, वो शुरू से हो रहा है. किस तरीके से वो संघर्ष होता है, वो अलग-अलग होता. And then Joan Scott says that when you talk about myths, there are these metaphorical inventions that they and myths can still be open-ended but it is normative traditions which interpret them in particular ways. So aapke paas, uh, har samaj mein, and I'll come to that later also, where Joan Scott is saying that every society has symbols which it uses. And these symbols contextualize uh, how you perceive the roles of men and women. So, you know, she, of course, talks about Christian society where she talks about, on one hand, Mother Mary, the whole notion of motherhood. On the other hand, Eve, who is the, seductor, uh, the seductress. And she says you have these opposing images uh, which are used in metaphoric inventions and imaginations. And they are there and those are interpreted uh, in particular ways. So whenever you talk about uh, women, you have to talk about the politics of representation. Ki mahilao ko kis tarike se darshaya gaya hai, uski rajaniti pe dhyan de. So, you know, this is something uh, uh, even, other, you know, when we come to sources, we'll talk about how there is an intentionality behind the text. When you read any text in, uh, in Umberto Eco talked about this, that you talk about intentionality. So whenever you are talking about women in Indian history, you go through a source. Now you have to see that what is the intention behind that source? Then there is the politics of representation, there's the politics of reiteration. क्यों बार बार मनु को दोहराया जाता है और ऐसा नहीं कि मनु को पूरी तरह से दोहराया जाता है जो भी उसमें से भी छांट छांट के जो आपको सूट कर रहा है वो दोहराया जाएगा so that itself, you see, the politics of representation and the politics of reiteration, that what are you reiterating again and again? That is something we have to keep in mind in gender history. And also the need to understand that when we are talking of women, we are talking about women uh, not only as a gendered category, but also as a social, legal, psychological, political category. So for historians, there is need, you know, this, um, the new emerging perspectives on feminism say that there is need to shift attention from uh, just talking about, you know, earlier we used to talk about status of women, position of women in Indian history. I'll come to that, why that happened. But from there, instead of asking those questions, we have to understand women as a social, legal, or a psychological category. And also, that we have to say, uh, focus on the process through which gender is created and experienced. And also that uh, we have to think critically about the approaches and the basic values that have informed feminine and women's history. Now coming to gendered histories, you know, right now, uh, up till now is just giving you the theoretical framework uh, on emerging perspectives and what we are going to be focusing on. And so Joan Scott and Judith Butler, to some extent, really, you know, give us that uh, framework. But when we talk about gender in history, we know 
that women's contributions have been implicit. So, you know, if you read something like Elise Bolding, the underside of history, Elise Bolding says, one, that man the hunter is a myth. This understanding that it was men who were bringing in, you know, food and women were sitting around the, you know, uh, near the caves and be uh, bearing children itself is wrong. And anthropological studies and uh, gender and archaeology uh, studies of those uh, uh, have shown that women play a very important role in subsistence activities. And Elise Bolding, in fact, says that in pre-industrial societies, women contribute 60% of production activities. So, Saat Pratishat Utpadan Me Yogdan Mahilae Deti Hai Prag or Dyogik Samajo Me. Iski Koi Charcha Matla Bhotkam Charcha Hoti Hai. Feminist historians, ne, uh, Jesse Ellis Bolding, ne, is, isko uh, ispe drishti dali hai. So, what we find is that women have been constantly engaged in production and reproduction activities. But primarily, there are uh, male-centric representations where women are represented mainly in their reproductive roles. And Gerda Lerner in her work, The Creation of Patriarchy, had very beautifully shown how the uh, control over reproduction predates control over production also. Chai Gerda Lerner ho, chai Claude Mayasu ho, they have talked about the fact, like, you know, Marxist uh, scholars talk about control over property and how class is the earliest form of social stratification. Feminist scholars like Gerda Lerner, Claude Mayasu have said that control over reproduction predates control over production. So gender is the first form of social categorization. Now, so women are represented in reproductive roles. The other thing when you talk about gender in history is that women have been constantly negotiating for resources, decision-making, for their role and stature, for gaining recognition, constantly pushing at the boundaries of their existence. This is not always obvious in representations of women. So here we are talking about the politics of representation. You know, this notion of women as victims. Women have been constantly negotiating. निर्णय अपने लिए निर्णय करने के लिए अपनी स्थिति अपने ओहदा अपने आप अपने जो उनके लिए सीमाएं बनाई जाती हैं उसके खिलाफ हमेशा वो संघर्ष कर रही ये आपको जो भी आप स्रोत लेंगे उसमें इतना ज्यादा आपको दिखेगा नहीं ये and that is why for feminist historians or gender sensitive historians, there's need to read into the silences. There's need to read against the grain. Ki kaha pe chuppi hai. Aur fir kya keh rahe hai us, us keh kya rahe hai aur matlab kya hai. To agar Manu bohat chinta kar rahe hai, Manu is saying that women should not join the Pashanda sects. That doesn't mean that no woman was joining the Pashanda sects. It means that women were joining the Pashanda sects. And that is why Manu is so worried that he is making a norm that women should not join the Pashanda sect. So, you are reading reading against the grain. What does it mean? If Manu is saying that Pashanda is a lot of Jain and other dharmas. कि महिलाओं को पाषंड गुट में नहीं आ, उनको नहीं जाना चाहिए तो आपको आप सोचेंगे कि वो प्राचीन भारत में तो महिला ये गुट में नहीं जा रही पर अगर आप 
उसका मतलब समझेंगे तो उसका ये मतलब है कि मनु ऐसे कह रहे हैं क्योंकि उनको ये चिंता है कि महिलाएं ये ज्वाइन कर सकती हैं और ये फिर पता चलता है कि महिलाएं कर ही रही हैं बिकॉज यू हैव सो मेनी इंस्क्रिप्शन दैट टॉक अबाउट वेमेन डोनेटिंग टू द स्तूपर्स एंड यू नो इन सांची Uh, scholars have done studies and in amravati and other regions to aapko praman bhi mil rahe hain ki mahila baudh dharm aur jain dharm ko de rahi hain sanrakshan daan de rahi hain so that itself you know you need to read against the grain and why we talk about women in ancient history specifically and that becomes such a political and important and contentious issue is when we start raising this question of women's issues in 19th century in india in colonial period now i'm sure many of you are already familiar with this but uh, because uh, i was told that you know we should talk a little about the modern and the ancient and how they are connected i'm very quickly going to going to go through this and please forgive me for those you know who this is obvious knowledge a uh, historiographical literature from the late century onwards pays a lot of it attention to women's issues to mahila ke mudde jaise samajik sudhar ke mudde shuru ho rahe the there was intelligentsia which, which was involved there's growing feelings of nationalism social info, uh, reform movements widow remarriage child marriage such issues were taken up but it's also important for us to understand that how this creates a vision of the golden age of women in vedic period now that is uh, you know in order to trace that you need to see what are the political developments in indian subcontinent in late 18th and 19th centuries Now I'll just give you the example of the debate on sati. I think most of you know about this, but I'll still uh, reiterate this. It's a case study on how reformist social legislation on women perp perpetuates the mystique of ancient India. Lata Mani has shown how the social reform debate was not primarily about women. but what construes as authentic cultural tradition to aap mahila jab aap sati ke bare mein debate kar rahe ho to aap mahila ko mool mudda nahi bana ke bharatiya sanskriti kya hai wo mudda jyada tha so in order to show that uh, sati is not sanctioned in hindu tradition you go back to the manusmriti and say manusmriti says that you know this is how widows should be uh, treated so that means he is not endorsing uh, sati so instead of saying that sati is against uh, you know uh, it's a callous uh, the, uh, uh, you know thing and it's not a modern aspect so it's not a very modern debate so in modern india which is happening you are quoting ancient texts to show why sati should not happen to ye prashn uthati hai lata mani mani ki kis tarike se jab aap sati ki baat kar rahe ho to aap ye nahi kar rahe ki sati ek galat prata hai kyunki adhunik bharat mein aisa nahi hona chahiye ya aap kisi aur ko maar rahe ho ya wo khud hi marne ki koshish kar rahe hai to isliye wo आप ये कह रहे हो कि ये गलत प्रथा है क्योंकि मनु ने भी इसका नहीं कहा गया तो आप मनु को एक मूल मान के फिर आप चल रहे हो एक मॉडर्न स्टेट में तो ये बहुत आधुनिक कोई डिबेट नहीं था एंड इन फैक्ट इन सच कंडीशन वॉट इज हैपनिंग इज द ओल्डर द व्यवस्था यू नो एंड द मोर लेजिटमेसी इट इज गेटिंग ना द सेम थिंग अबाउट विडो रीमैरिज एक्ट you are trying to you are making stipulations related to a woman and saying that she should remarry rather than you know sorting out issues related to women and property you are linking women's identity with marriage aapko lag raha hai ki wo dobara shaadi punar vivah ho jayega to sab theek ho jaye 
and just recently i did a talk on you know this age of uh, how the age of uh, women uh, the girls age for marriage is being increased and so this whole notion why are you associating women with marriage there's time to you know unlock these connections that women equals marriage equals security stability etc cetera, etc cetera. there is it's time that you see women on her own and her as her own identity and so the widow remarriage actually was a backlash because it denied property to women who had remarried so anyway women would not remarry and that you know and uh, how it becomes a deterrent not only for high caste women also but the lower caste who were in any way go, uh, uh, remarry so this is you know this analysis of even the so called social reforms how they were not women centric or modern but how they were it just shows how when you have policies which don't talk about women but talk about social conditions as perceived by men and that to only one category of elite property men then the rules and regulations and the thinking will become a little warped to jab aap mahila ko kendrit karke aap nitiyan nahi banaoge aur fir niti banayenge bas ek chhota sa gut jo ki purush hai aur fir unke paas sampatti bhi hai aur unke paas sara nirnay banane ki bhi kshamta hai तो वो फिर महिला के बारे में नीति बनाएंगे तो फिर वो ऐसे ही नीतियां बनेंगे जहां पे महिला को केंद्र रख के नीतियां नहीं बन एंड दैट इज वाई यू नो आई मीन आई एम नॉट इवन गोइंग इन टू ऑल दिस पार्थ चैटर्जी एंड द डिबेट्स रिलेटेड टू दैट बट हाउ व्हेन यू टॉक अबाउट राइटिंग ऑफ हिस्ट्री ऑफ वेमेन इट मीन्स यू आर चेंजिंग द नोशन ऑफ हिस्ट्री ऑल्सो where you are encompassing the personal the subjective along with public and political activity so you know how there is um, in 19th and 20th century the domestic space becomes a private space where women become the custodians of cultural traditions so the more devout the women the more your culture could be sustained men are being exposed this is for the intelligence yeah not all men but men are being exposed to western education and while men are being exposed to that women have to become the custodians of the cultural tradition so ye jo uh, distinction ubhar ke aa raha hai male versus female public versus private material versus spiritual in a outer versus in a those distinctions are becoming even more fraught and whether it's parth chatterji or sumit sarkar or tonika sarkar they have written about this about how uh, there is this uh, even untoned burden for example uh, the household as an archive so they've written about this whole dichotomies that uh, are created between inner and outer space so it is in this context that you have these modern uh, constructs of what was happening to women in ancient india so the image of womanhood is created so while you are conscious that women in modern india are facing lot of problems education age of marriage property rights whatever you look for a golden past where you feel that women were not uh, uh, facing these problems and this is for your own identity also uh, and what is interesting is i'm not even focusing on all the writings but even women writers internalized this so bahut sare mahila lekhak bhi thi jo is tarike se likh rahi thi for example claris bader she uh, comes out with a work in 1867 and um, most ancient india scholars are uh, uh, familiar with bader she is one of the ones who really talks about eastern spirituality 
कि महिला जो महिला है भारत की वो कितनी धार्मिक है और कितनी पतिव्रता टाइप है और फिर यू नो द होल नोशन ऑफ हाउ बेटर प्रेज द इंडियन वुमेन्स पायटी स्पिरिचुअलिटी द डिवोशन टू द फैमिली एंड देन शी सेज इट्स द कृष्णा कल्ट which brings about the decline and eventually it's only christianity which can save uh, uh, women and her stress is on heroic lives of women so ek taraf mahilaye khud aise likh rahi hain clarice bader jaisi on the other side there are women uh, who talk about you who internalize these notions of the golden age of women uh like for example kalash bhasini devi uh in the um uh, second half of 19th century she writes about parda and child marriage and fully in polygamy and she says these were not known in ancient times similarly kumudini mitra she writes about the valor of six so on one hand there is this notion that women are facing miseries on the other hand there is this uh, enhancement of masculinity of certain uh, tribes like the six for example so the martial races so even women are internal internalizing these notions uh, sarla devi who was born in tagore family you know she says she is asking men that they should become more masculine and fight the britishers now she uh, revives this uh, festival of beer ashtami where heroes were um, celebrated uh, a little different from this is pandita ramabai who uh, you know uh, uh, because she is a widow herself realizes the kind of uh, what uma chakravarti has talked about how the uh, you know the social death which is re related to widowhood can be seen in uh, pandita Ram ramabai's works too Uh, and her work is interesting because she knew uh, sanskrit she was able to understand there is some difference between the texts and customary practices and how you know one has to explore this similarly you have iv horner who talked about women in primitive buddhism and she talks about buddha sources and uh, her work is again a little different because she is talking about women in the household about women and um, bikunis and uh, the role that they play it's in 1938 when altikar writes the position of women in civ uh, indian civilization in hindu civilization uh, this is published and it's at that time a path breaking work because it talks about position of women uh, he regards the vedic period as the best period then he says that from this point onwards there's a decline uh um, he says it was the best period because in the household the aryan male um, was preoccupied with warfare and th that is why they gave a lot of attention to women because women were managing the household but uh, uma chakravarti in her work uh, beyond the altikarian paradigm has shown how altikar's view was conditioned by the period he was writing in between the world wars so that was what was happening in the world war period where the men were out in to war and women were managing the uh, households and uh, livelihood of their families and keeping that in mind he thought that the vedic period also the position of women he says uh, position of women was fairly satisfactory and that they were distinguished poets tesses and sati was not happening at that time now uh then he says that gradually this changes and that is because of the introduction of the non aryan wife and that leads to the deterioration of women and that women who were ignorant in sanskrit language and also the introduction of the servile shudras meant that women's labor was not being recognized in the household now that itself shows that um there are certain problems with altikar's work of course feminist critique show that it has internal coherence and it shows two very important trends one that there is decline in status of women but also that property rights related to women are being discussed more and more 
but the problems is are that he is accepting whatever the texts say in total as unproblematic sources and also that he is talking about elite women obviously because when he is talking about servile shudras a large component of the shudras were women so how can you say that women were not involved in labor when there are women dasis also so that whole understanding of women itself is simplistic and uh, that is the feminist critique of altikaran paradigm also that he explains the declining role of women uh, in a very simplistic way and obviously is confining himself to upper class women and he is using the sources as something that is unproblematized but you know the influence of altikar is very prominent in all the works that follow so there are many such works i'm just citing some of them and they all focus on status of women in a sense rather than discussing their socio economic uh, status gradually of course uh, you do find that questions are being raised by feminist historians uh, suvida jaiswal uma chakravarti kumkum roy they are dealing with different types of sources uh, they are also talking about gender relations in the context of caste and class uh, relations and if you see what are their contributions uh, one is that they talk about how the control over reproduction and sexuality was central to the creation and maintenance of caste hierarchies so these in, you have to give cognizance to that so whether it is uh, uma chakravarti in gendering caste or suvira jaiswal in her work caste um, kumkum roy has written about it others like us are writing about it that how control over reproduction and control over sexuality is central to the creation of caste hierarchies also the role of the state and religious ideological structures in enforcing uh, mechanisms of, of patriarchy also if you see um, uh, these works of uma chakravarti and kumkum roy they are talking about how when it comes to uh, talking about women all the sources whether it's brahmanical whether it's buddhist whether it's jain they all talk talk about stri swabhav what uh, you know the nature of women and what is the nature of women they are fick weak they are fickle they are promiscuous they can, and that is why they need to be controlled and if you need to control them then you need to have notions and norms like stri dharma so the whole notion of stri dharma it's not as if they're talking only about dharma of the uh, women they're talking about rajya dharma they're talking about uh, uh, the uh, guru dharma or you know the dharma of different categories but specifically when it comes to women the dharma is related to how she has to uh, uh, behave in a familial context so the notion of women in the family in the family becomes very strongly entrenched and this is what these um, uh, perspectives show us <clears throat> and if you see um, for example the whole notion of stri swabhav uh, and stri dharma it's there in not only buddhist jain traditions but also ancient greek christian islamic traditions where there is uh, this uh, tendency towards male centeredness and this association of women with particular uh, in particular way now uh, what i would like you to focus on is something different and that is that when you talk about sources we are not getting to know about society as such so you can't say ancient society was like this 
what you can say is that this particular society uh, text or epigraph or whatever source you're say, uh, talking about represents women like this. So that is a very different way or perspective of looking at कि आप किसी आप कोई भी तरीके से आप ये नहीं कह सकते कि प्राचीन भारत या मध्यकालीन भारत में समाज ऐसा था क्योंकि हमारे पास उतना ज्यादा हमारे पास डेटा नहीं है कि समाज पूरे समाज के बारे में हम कह दें कि समाज में बहुत विविधता होती है हमें जो पता लगता है वो ये पता लगता है कि किस तरीके से इस स्रोत में क्या प्रतीक कर रहे हैं सो वॉट आर दे रेप्रेजेंटिंग क्या दर्शा रहे हैं और किस तरीके से ये दर्शाया जा रहा है सो दैट इज वॉट वी हैव टू फोकस ऑन हाउ वेमेन आर रेप्रेजेंटेड इन हिस्टोरिकल ट्रेडिशन and there we see that they carry out production and reproduction activities but there is over emphasis on some aspects uh there is also the fact that uh when you talk about these representations like i just talked about how when we uh, try to see what manu is saying they are more about anxieties but they're still important as sources because they lead us into the psyche of the person who's writing it so in that sense the sources become important because they tell us about how the thinking was at that time it tells us about the epistemological traditions of that time ki us samay gyan ki dharnaye kaisi thi it tells us about what is the language being used and obviously then the text come out of a social milieu to koi samajik sandarbh mein hi koi granth likh raha hai ya koi abhilekh likh raha hai to wo samajik sandarbh to hai par usi ek cheez ko lekar aap ye nahi keh sakte ki pura sabhyata waisi thi ya pura samaj hi waisa tha because there is there are divergences and like for example i have worked on engendering the early household in the grah sutras so they tell us about brahmanical perceptions and that to some of them so it's not as but they also attempt to filter down to other areas because the rituals that you are that are being mentioned in the household uh if you are writing text dedicated to the household the griha then you are projecting the household as a sacred space for production you are celebrating rituals related to the boy the male child while also you know in a uh, marginal way acknowledging the uh, daughter so you have upanayan for the male child you have the godan karma which is the first shaving of the child you have um, so upanayan means after this the child is going to get formal training so here there is gender segregation in the household in the conceptualizations of the grah sutras so that itself then and these are practices which carried out the grah sutras mention practices from birth to death janam se lekar antyeshti tak kis tarike se kaun se anushthan hone chahiye aur ye jyada tar anushthan purush pradhan anushthan hi hai kyunki aap upnayan ki baat kar rahe hain aap godan karm ki baat kar rahe hain vivah bhi kya hai vivah hai kanya daan so the very word itself kanya daan uh, means that the woman is being the kanya is being given and so it shows that it is a contract between the male kinsman the father of the kanya and the reci recipient who is the groom so such terms itself show how there is a demarcation of roles of men and women but also they show that they were being practiced also because you know such practices continued so then we come through you know how 
Sheldon Pollock says this, texts reflect and regulate practice also. So they may not be completely showing what society was exactly at that time, but they do reflect and they, because later on then they get quoted, so they regulate practices also. And so it's very important when we are talking about gender relations to understand that the sources that we are dealing with are problematic and male-centric. There's need to understand why there is preoccupation and uh, with only particular roles of women because there's anxiety related to reproduction and control of women. Also, what we need to understand is that women have been constantly contributing through labor, through social linkaging, through creating networks, uh, create, uh, in rituals and rites. And so gender studies, while it needs to concentrate on social aspects and aspects related to household reproduction kinship, it also needs to talk about political, social, economic, technological, ideological structures. Because unless it's, you know, the private intervenes into the public and, uh, you know, the, the initial uh, relations of production and reproduction are, uh, you know, worked out in households and then spill over elsewhere, while other forms of discursive power work from elsewhere and spill over into the household. So, you know, it's not as if these are separate from each other. Now you have to tell me till when I get time to go on, you know, I can just go on and on forever. So one of you has to tell me how much time I have for speaking and I can stop at any point. Uh, Ma'am, maybe another, Mobin, what do you think? Another five, 10 minutes or so? Uh, yeah, I think, ma'am, you can wind up maybe uh, and then we can take questions because I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. Maybe another five minutes. All we right. can wind up. Okay. Is that okay, ma'am? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Thank so you. one thing which I want to say uh, towards the end is that uh, it's again something which we had started with is how we have to talk about the problem of women's agency. That how are we, we did say that we have to see women as agents. So we have to see that how are women as agents? And how are women as agents? And how are women as agents? And how are women as Now, the problem of agency of women is because we have an absence of voices. We have to see uh, women have not been passive victims we've been saying that but also the question that comes up is why do women participate in systems that subordinate them because we just said that women also participate in those systems so this has been talked about by feminist scholars it's very complex Women are part of the society's ideological, political structures that they live in. So they, it's the ideology, it is political processes, resource allocations. And when all this doesn't work, force, coercion, violence, so women, even financially independent or economically independent women in the modern context have to face violence, you know, at times or very often because violence is so deeply prevalent in our contemporary society. That is something which we have to pay attention to. And this mindset and attitude is such that if ideology, you know, there is this concerted ideological, political, 
and although you know our constitution and other legal uh, frameworks are in place but their implementation the mindset the attitudes is not so when you talk about women and agency you need to understand that there are different ways women respond in some places it's a negative agency and that is why you know if you read gayatri spivak she talks about you know can the subaltern speak and she talks about how when you cannot speak then the role of suicide in that that how the voiceless find a voice then so there are different forms of resistances where women do resist but it doesn't mean that resistance leads to empowerment and that is where we have to discuss agency because agency is very uh, you know it's it's not simple women have always used their negotiating skill uh, skills agency implies instrumentality then you have the question of have women been instrumental in shaping their lives or being social actors and so when you take up the question of agency you have to understand that there is limited agency there are constraints sometimes they strategize what has been called bargains with patriarchy that you you know just to exist you sometimes have bargains with patriarchy or you take path of least resistance and that is what i also say that agency or application you know just like there are multiple patriarchies there are multiple negations and resistances and it doesn't always lead to empowerment it can lead to change in strategies of domination where patriarchy will become reinforced and if you just see what is happening to the cyber space women thought this is a safe space where they can be articulate and be free and then there is so much misogyny there's so much vehemence and abhorrence that you are going to stamp out women who speak freely and i'm not saying all men do this or all you know women are doing it to women also so this is about perceptions about attitudes and about understanding that it is contextual also so i'll stop here for today and then we can just go into a discussion mode if if there is any need for discussion yes students please uh, post your questions in the chat box i think there are already some questions laya you could i think start by taking them one by one and uh, those of you uh, yes, your hands sorry just a minute i will try and unmute you if it is or any of the co-hosts can but in case we are unable to uh, you would please have to write it we will try to unmute uh, Sh uh, shibani ma'am i yeah. think uh, we have questions from some very respected colleagues of ours yes, i can see that <laughs> uh, and, i think can we yeah. unmute them as co-host yeah, i think I we guess, can right like rajiv singh ji is there priyam barua is there yeah would you Nan do rajiv. that moment please huh. yeah Yeah, Laya, you could begin by you know uh, asking the question which has been posted, and then we could try and unmute them one by one. Yeah. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I request uh, Isha, Ishika to uh, please continue. Thank you, Laya. We have our first question, and the question is from Anushka. Ma'am, do you think the Western view of their women over ages is somehow more comprehensive than the Indian view? why or why not 
Uh, I don't think there's one Western view, just like I don't think there's one Indian view. And um, like uh, in the Western context also, there have been several waves of feminism. So we call it feminisms. And the first wave and the second wave have been criticized and have been, you know, but the fact is that if they uh, weren't there, then you wouldn't move forward. So I don't think it's been more comprehensive. I think study of women has to be contextual, but you have to have a theoretical frame, framework. You have to know, you have to understand power and gender relations and all that has gone in, into. And that is why I talk about Judith Butler and I talk about uh, Joan Scott and many others, you know, who are Western scholars. But then also talk about feminist scholars in the context of India, and then have my own interpretation also. Thank you. Ma uh, I have made uh, uh, Priyam and uh, Ra uh, Ra uh, Dr. Rajiv Singh co-host, so I think you should now be able to unmute and ask your questions. Uh, can I speak? This is Priyam or Rajiv, after Rajiv, sir. Priyam, go ahead. Priyam, go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, this is Dr. Priyam Barua from the Department of History. And thank you for such a discursive uh, engagement about uh, the historical reality of women and how uh, you have provided a diachronic study of the whole representation of women. Uh, Ma'am, uh, here, uh, what I would draw is that uh, to the point that we have very pertinently raised, that is that uh, the intentionality of representation or what you have termed as the politics of representation. The Brahmanical texts uh, definitely, you know, it they kind of uh, codify the practices, idioms related to women. And these are in academics uh, uh, very profusely theorized. So uh, here I would draw your attention to the Buddhist Tantra, Tantric text, uh, which can be taken as uh, the stark reversal of the male and female roles as present, presented in this whole vivastic conventional symbolisms. So ma'am, uh, here we would take one example of the Dombini, which uh, belongs to the Domba sect, and how actually uh, she has been engaged in various, uh, because of her veritable pariah status by birth, and she has been engaged in the works, in cremation places, being a scavenger, a weaver, as a, a fishing woman, and she has been depicted as a preferred sexual partner by the uh, yogi. And ma'am, what we can say is that definitely, and by being her, as I have already uh, mentioned, and I reiterate that by virtue of her birth, uh, being placed in a veritable social pariah status, and she is a living embodiment, embodiment of the vulva. So here I would uh, say, draw your attention to this thing is that there is no expectation of reproduction from her. In such acts, the yogi also has no revulsion. Uh, because uh, otherwise it would be taken as ordinarily very polluting an act and normally very repugnant woman from a, with a repugnant woman. So here he represents the lowest as the highest and the most profane as the most sacred. But then would not, uh, isn't it something kind of it to an alternative politics of representation where she still remains invariably where, there, you know, where the Hindu lawgivers would put her. She's again there. I mean, but the politics of representation has been in a very uh, different and in a very uh, altered way. But the meaning remains intrinsically where she is from. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Priyam. I mean, that's a, a very uh, interesting example. And uh, I don't know if you're talking about a tantric sect because the yogi is a tantric yogi because I know in tantrism, there is subversion of Brahminical practices. But even so, like you yourself pointed out, the representations are very um, sort of related to women's body. And if you're saying it's the vulva, she is a representation of the vulva without the uh, notion of uh, the 
reproductivity attached to it, it's again something where you are uh, sort of enhancing the sexuality of a woman. So I'm not, because I'm not that familiar with the sources that you have been quoting, I cannot say anything further. Okay, ma'am. But it's very interesting. Uh, uh, you can take the example of a Sahajayana act, uh, uh, text, like the uh, Charyapad. You can take it as, uh, and you know this is an esoteric uh, uh, Buddhist tantric text, the Sahajayana text. You can take the example of the Charyapad, ma'am, as a source. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, ma thank you. Uh, it's interesting, again, you know, how all the tantric uh, philosophies converge. Yes, uh, in the you know uh, early medieval period i mean yeah. I, I don't know what is the age of this text that you're quoting but that itself is very ma interesting eight to nine centuries AD, ma'am. all right yes so that's yes. what i thought very interesting thank you thank you so much thank you dr rajiv singh you can unmute and and speak i have uh, made you a co-host and anybody else who wants to ask a question directly please raise your hand i will try and unmute uh, Dr. Shibani, thank you so much. And uh, I am also thankful to Dr. Mubin for uh, reminding me and calling me to attend this program. I don't know whether I fit into this program being from the science background, but yeah, uh, when I uh, saw the title of the talk of Madam, like uh, the title was Indian History and it was related to women issue. I have been working, uh, despite being from the science background, I've been working in the Indian history field, at least from the scientific point of view. Uh, Ma'am, I have an observation also, and one question also. Like as an observation, when that uh, talk, or your title of the talk was Indian history, uh, but your talk was completely Hindu centric. So when we talk about Indian history or Indian society as a whole, it was not only Hinduism. Uh, maybe you have not worked upon or you if you have worked upon uh, other religions also i would appreciate uh, had you given those examples also so that it had been you know a completely uh, comprehensive and we would have appreciated that thing uh, secondly i would like to know if some examples do exist uh, whether you have worked on them or if others have worked on uh, the role of women in other religions also like uh, you comp uh, you gave the details about Manu and all that. I understand. I really uh, appreciate those points which you raised. Uh, being in the modern perspective, these things shouldn't exist. But then when we talk about Indian history, I believe I need to know some more examples from other religions too. Uh, because I've been working in this like uh, in, from the scientific point of view, if we talk about Leelawati or there are many other great Indian scientists who have been working in this field. So I would appreciate some examples from you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv ji. I'm sorry I didn't get the time or, you know, my, actually, I have worked on Buddhist texts also. So, uh, if because this, um, my particular presentation has 68 slides, out of which five or six are on Buddhism. So, I, I didn't get time to go there. And uh, where, um, so, uh, I try to show how even within a Buddhist um, texts, you have examples of misogyny or androcentrism, even though they are giving soteriological, um, uh, you know, they're providing soteriological avenues to women through the notion of nirvana. There is misogyny there also, and there is androcentrism also. So I understand what you're saying that, you know, uh, coming from a space of ancient India, uh, my work is limited to particular texts only. And that's why, you know, I take Manu as a example because most people are familiar with Manu. And uh, also when, uh, you know, you talked about other texts like Lilavati and all, I'm sure there are, I, I mean, I have presentations where I've talked about informal systems of knowledge where i have been talking about the knowledge traditions um, relating to women in in the ancient indian context so there you get references to vedic poetesses or for example you get references to buddhist teachers but again the manner in which the references are made and the way it is made 
is also uh, uh, open to interpretation. So, uh, and why I say informal systems of um, knowledge transmission, because it's the men uh, and not all men, only some men who have access to the formal systems of knowledge tra transmission, at least in the uh, ancient context. So uh, I'm sorry if you know, you're working on something particular and I have not been able to address no, the no, issues okay. which you were working on. No, no, it's completely okay. The thing is, like, I wanted some examples from the scientific point of view, some women who have been working, you know, the contributions of Indian women, uh, that would have been great uh, for my studies. No, I completely agree with your points. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am, if I just uh, mention one thing here, just something came to my mind, what Rajiv has asked a question. I think we have a lot of progressive Muslim women uh, who've been, uh, especially from Urdu literature, uh, who've been working on, and even if you see Sufi scholars, uh, Sufi Muslim women also, and saints also, who uh, kind of, uh, they actually just uh, decline and disown the religious perspective and uh, talk about their own identity. So Rajiv, if you wish to you know, know something about, uh, since you mentioned other religions, so Sufi and uh, women contributions. I would, I would love to know because, you know, is an interesting this area. Is, this is complete Indian history. When we talk about Indian history, this is the be... modern context you're talking about, right? Movie? Yes, Muslim yes, ma'am. The Muslim progressive women yeah. writers, especially fact, when they got English education. Yes, so we have a yes, lot yes. of, uh, and most of them, I, I think that will also connect, ma'am, with your perspective about the elite group of women because they were the ones who were uh, you know who were quite uh, they had the access to that kind of education they were not yes. from we the... just actually we just did a talk in WSDC on the uh, uh, Muslim women intellectual space the men yes, films. yes right right that's, 19th that's a... and early 20th century um, particularly in uh, Bengal and other regions gee, gee, gee. so it was a very interesting talk so we have I mean you know one uh, there is a, a lot of material there but then again there we raise this point that it is the elite intellectual yes, educated women in these mayfields and they are the ones you know um, they are not only uh, elite and educated, but they're also corresponding with women, Muslim women from Egypt mm -hmm. and other countries which are also facing this kind of, you know, mm -hmm. the colonial uh, sort of uh, uh, regimes in their area. So it was a very interesting talk. Yeah. Uh, I, if you want, I can send you the... Yes, the name please. of the person who's uh, Shrijata Paul. She was speaking yes. on this. Very interesting. Yeah, Ishika, I think you're already unmuted. So please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, it's not exactly a question, but a uh, uh, mere observation. And I would like if you could uh, correct it or review it. So, ma'am, I guess uh, it's you talked about the politics of representation, and ma'am, uh, these there is no you know archaeological evidence that uh, uh, men were the hunters and women were take uh, you know were working at the household or in the caves because obviously those were the ancient times, and we can't prove that this was the case or these were the gendered notions. And secondly, ma'am, if we move further, uh, ma'am how political and social changes were affecting these gender notions because there was spread of Buddhism and Jainism and uh, the, you know, the Brahmins were afraid of uh, that uh, their religion would decline uh, eventually. So they started, you know, creating these texts that uh, would, uh, you know, uh, have rules and notions for both men and women and somehow women were uh, subdued in these, uh, you know, these texts. And even in modern times, we have these uh, texts, maybe they were uh, uh, because of the Orientalist of Britain that uh, somehow distorted the history. Because I guess political and social changes have been from ancient times to modern times have, you know, affected these gender notions. So we don't have any, you know, uh, what I would say very conspicuous evidences to prove that uh, what was actually going on in the society and what was written in the text. 
Yes, I think what the points that you have raised are uh, very significant because, you know, uh, as what, uh, as I've been trying to say in this brief period of time is that when you look at a source, that itself is very varied. And again, you know, like, for example, I gave you the example of Manu. Now, Manu, um, on one hand, you know, everybody quotes Manu uh, as saying that Yatra Nari Pujaste Ramante Tatra Devata. So wherever women are worshipped, those uh, in those households, the uh, gods live. But I tell everybody, just see the context in which he's saying it, because the following sentences say that if you don't worship them, or if they are, uh, if they are displeased, then they will uh, bring uh, destruction to the household. So, you know, this notion of agency as something that is negative, that if women, you know, are either auspicious or inauspicious. And it's something which I talk about in my text, you know, Sumangala. So the whole notion of women as being, you know, especially conforming women who are, um, you know, carrying out all the rituals and also so mangala so vrata somebody who's doing all the proper rituals vrat and is auspicious in contrast is somebody who brings death and destruction and these are the and that is why you know i talked about john scott's notion of uh, you know metaphoric interventions and contradictions so here you are talking about auspiciousness of women on one hand, inauspicious on the other hand. But if you see Manu again, Manu says Brun Hatya is like Brahman Hatya. So if you are destroying an embryo, you are killing a Brahman. But see the amount of feticide we had, or we have had, or are still having. So you know, where it suits you, you are accepting Manu. Where it doesn't, you are not. So there is a politics of reiteration also. And you have to look at the sources in totality. Manu is saying that at that time is not, you know, should not be relevant for us. We should be, because we are in a different period, we should be conscious of the fact that Manu has written this, this, this. But we can't say, oh, Manu wrote this. That is why there is patriarchy. Or Manu felt that way. That is why we can't blame our ills on ancient texts. We have sought to reiterate, repeat, and replicate them. And there is a whole politics of that. So we have to look at the genealogy of that. Why was why were so many commentaries written on Manu in the medieval period? What is the politics behind that? Why did when the Britishers came, they looked towards Manu for determining what is you know how to uh, sort of codify the legal systems? So all I'm trying to say is that, you know, you can't collapse the modern with the ancient and say, Aisa ho hai prachin mein bhi aisa tha. because no, what was in the ancient context was in a different time space locale. And at that context, at that time, it was, there was some intention behind uh, writing or compiling or, uh, you know, collecting a text. And now, if we are repeating it and reiterating it, there is some other intention and context. So, as students of history, we have to be conscious of that. I don't know, I mean, if I in any way settle some of the doubts you had, Ishika. Yes, ma'am. Uh, very, uh, and then we have other evidences. For example, from seventh and eighth century, we have coins that are inscribed on queen's name. We had Rudruma Devi in the seventh century, if I'm not wrong. And there are other evidences that we need to take a look at to, you know, to come to a conclusion as much we can. Yeah, 
Yes. And you know what I'm saying is that look at the anxieties of these texts. So the moment you see what they are concerned about, then you get to know what was, you know, happening or what they are fearing that can happen. And so rather than take them literally or at face value or say that this is how society was, it tells us more about the concerns and the problems and what we get to know. And um, also, even within the text, there's no homogeneity. There are lots of views and counter views. And that is why, again, when I started off, I said that, you know, it is uh, normative. Uh, you know, you cannot say that this is what a text says. That is very normative way of looking at it. They are open-ended. They are open to interpretation. And you have to keep visit, revisiting. And especially if you're feminist historians, June O'Connor has said, reread, revisit, and then reconstruct the history. I think, you know, uh, uh, as students of literature, I think, Ishika, that is why we emphasize so much on the context, not just the text, you know, the, the historical material, you know, uh, context of a text, how the text is produced, what are the kind of, you know, uh, forces which are, you know, which are present, which, you know, uh, create a certain text in a certain way. I think that is something that, Manjula, you have a question. I have made you a co-host. So if you're there, you could ask the question directly. Uh, thank you, Shivani. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Professor Teagi. This was wonderful. I am a colleague of Shivani in the English department. So there are some uh, common concerns. Uh, thank you for articulating so many of the issues and giving us a historical perspective. Uh, I'm greatly obliged. I don't think I have a question. It's probably an observation that too it could be ill-formed. But uh, this is an observation that comes from uh, not really uh, academic uh, insight. It comes from a general perception. And this is about resistance to feminist intervention from women themselves. You know, this is uh, all around us within the community. We talk to other people very often, you know, other women. There is a kind of self-righteousness you know, it could be, as you said, it comes from the ideological, uh, you know, from uh, the field uh, internalized or whatever we use the word, in, uh, you know. Um, so uh, it is actually uh, internalization of what we call dominant ideology, patriarchal. And we've seen um, in life, in literary texts also representations, you know, the older women, uh, especially earlier in a joint family or otherwise, they would, uh, you know, they would grow within the family in stature, sharing some of that patriarchal power. Even otherwise, other than this instance, what actually I realize that there is, uh, there continues to be a certain kind of a self-righteousness, a certain celebration of the essentialist feminist, uh, you know, you made that point, which of course we uh, have, uh, you know, uh, Iskri Sobhav, you said. Uh, this is again, as I said, you know, uh, Simon Bevor, uh, she speaks of that. So this is not just in academics, in actual, as I said, you know, when we interact with people across, uh, very often middle class, etc., whichever the space it could be, you know, there is this kind of a self-righteous resistance, internalized values. It also leads to a certain sharing of power of the patriarchal power. So I had this idea when initially you mentioned, you know, how the discursive strategies of resistance, but this is also a discursive strat strategy of co-opting or empowerment, maybe in the reverse or, uh, you know, uh, whichever way I don't Domination. Know. Yeah, so these I continue to see and uh, uh, also you see uh, in families, you know, the mother, the sacrificing mother, in fact, it would, it's, I think, very interesting, the study of the mother figure, because the mother figure, I think, is so uh, uh, much more often appropriated by sons, right? Uh, and or maybe that is how she's more often spoken of. Of course, we have, as I said, even representations in terms of, you know, the daughter, Tagore's, for example, the letter 
uh, the um, notebook or the diary, you know, where the girl misses her mother, married early, child marriage and so on. We do have some of those. But I think this whole representation of mother appropriation by male uh, in terms of male representation and where the woman herself becomes invested not only in patriarchal power, empowerment ideology, she also becomes a role model, you know, for other women. This, I feel, is a continuing tendency. And uh, in terms of, uh, as I said, I'm not very clear in terms of my insights. How do we deal with this phenomena which is out there very much? Yeah, um, Manjula, I agree with what you have said. And it's something that uh, we have to contend with because I think there are these attitudes which are so, you know, ingrained that and women also internalize them women play a role in perpetuating them and we have to recognize that you know and thankfully now there aren't any workshops where you know people get up and say ki aurat hi aurat ki dushman hoti hai and all mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. but the fact is we need to understand and it's something which i also have talked about in another forum where i say that uh, this is in the ancient context where I'm talking about, you know, the devout woman and the mm -hmm. role of the devout woman. And I say how it is in polygonous households mm -hmm. where women compete not with men. They compete amongst themselves. So women are competing for resources, mm -hmm. for decision making, for male attention. Mm -hmm. And in that competition, you know, that whole, uh, I was trying to uh, get at the core of this vrata thing. Mm -hmm. Why women perform so many vrata? Yes. And then I realized that they're competing amongst them. So the more devout, the more, you know, austere or the more uh, vrat you will do in a household where there are many women, all of them yeah. competing for constraint of resources that is what is going to happen yes so i am not surprised when women compete amongst themselves because that is you know we are humans there are constraints for resources and uh, in modern societies it would seem that men uh, boys and girls and men and women are competing together yes. and that uh, but we also know that there is inequality of opportunities, there is inequality of resources. And nowadays, when I conduct a gender workshop, mm -hmm. I say that the time has gone where we used to say that mm -hmm. women can do everything men can do. Okay. We mm -hmm. know that women do everything. Yes. Can men do everything that women can do? Okay. Yes. And then again, uh, one of my favorite quotes is Gerda Learners, where I say that, that women have children is because of nature, mm -hmm. but that they nurture children is because of culture. Men can mm -hmm. be as nurturing, as uh, you know, open, as sensitive, just mm -hmm. let them be. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's women and men who, perpetuate notions of masculinity and femininity. Mm -hmm. We have to move away from those polarities and talk about a spectrum. Yes. Where mm -hmm. I can be a provider as well as nurturing as a woman. And a man can be a provider as well as nurturing as a man. And there can be intermixture of all these also, you know, so that there's a whole spectrum of these. Right. Also, this overemphasis on the mother figure. Yeah. Is again something which is uh, very, very restrictive for women. And that's again something which I've discussed in my book, you know, this mm -hmm. sacralization of the role of the mother yeah. and the wife. Because then that is what it traps them into. Yes. Then you're always seen as a mother. And I, I don't even like when women are called ammas or, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, behen or ma. Mm -hmm. Because women, that again links them to male identities. Yes. That you're wife of someone or mother of someone or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to be related to some male. 
Yes. And then that male is the protective figure. Yes. When is it that women will be independent of their identities right. and yeah. be seen as an entity which is independent from others? Mm. So, I mean, of course, these are all social, cultural issues. Yes. And we are chipping away at these attitudes. <laughs> and, you know, the very reason Absolutely. why I like to talk Mm -hmm. about these issues mm -hmm. and you know uh, is because of this that uh, the more we reach out and mm -hmm. you, uh, the more the more understanding we are towards each other when we understand the context in which people make these kinds of you know what you're saying mm -hmm. they have this self-righteousness mm -hmm. but if you understand the context in which they have this self-righteousness then it will be easier for us or for them to have a middle point. A point. And I'm not saying it's us and them. In mm. some scenarios, I am self-righteous. <laughs> In others, you know, so there is no us and them also because yeah. I am also a part of this. Yes. Uh, so, I you know, think... I don't know if this discussion really, I hope it helps, other, you know, our students and others also. I'm sure, ma'am, because I was uh, very happy to sort of, you know, see that uh, Joan Scott has just very recently been sort of uh, been made a part of the lit theory paper that English uh, department offers. And you oh, sort God. of, you, know, you uh, reference. So I hope some of my students were there. And uh, you know, I think it's, it's uh, especially for those from literature, because I think there were a lot of history students and uh, obvious, uh, uh, faculty from the history department. But I think uh, like Manjula, I think uh, those of us who come from literature, I think this kind of a historical materialist perspective, you know, offers a whole new way of uh, approaching literature or adds to our sort of, you know, engagement with literature. That was, and I think we're completely out of time. So I would request move into uh, please give the vote of thanks and uh, I, I can see there are still many queries but I'm sorry but I think this has been such a I mean it's been an amazing talk I mean so I you know I think the questions will keep coming and I think it's good we have questions we'll keep engaging with them but for right now I think we need to uh, kind of wind up the program yes move in. Okay. yeah thank you Shabani uh, it's it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this and um, I must say, uh, Professor Jayataki, you have uh, kindled so many questions and uh, you have made us revisit certain perspectives on uh, women in Indian uh, history, emerging perspectives. Uh, on behalf of the Women Development Cell and Atmaram Sanatan Dharma College, uh, I would like to thank Professor Tyagi for uh, bringing out so many pertinent points. I'll just like to quickly uh, mention certain points that, that really you know, struck uh, you spoke about uh, gender as a, as a spectrum and how it is perceived individually and uh, how women play an important role and the, the politics of representation of women. I think that is one thing that we need to perceive. And uh, as a historian, what struck me was that how historiographical traditions and scriptures are, you know, analyzed and understood with gender perspective. I think that's really going to help our students who are going to pursue research in future. Uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, our esteemed colleagues who are here. And let me tell you, Professor Tyagi, we have colleagues, not only from history and English department, we have colleagues from the department of chemistry. And I did see Prof uh, Pinky Dureja ma'am also, and uh, <laughs> from physics and chemistry. So I would like, and we had friends from economics department. So thank you, my dear colleagues, uh, Dr. Rajiv, Priyam Barua, Ajit, Ajita, Apala Naidu, Vijika, Dr. Manjula, and uh, I, I don't know, I think I'm missing out on some names. I would also like to thank all the members of the Women Development Cell, Dr. Manisha, Dr. Swati, Dr. Rajkumar Bhagat, the only male member of the Women Development Society, uh, Dr. Preeti and Nidhi. And uh, before I uh, conclude, uh, Professor Tyagi, who has said a few things, उससे मुझे एक नज़म बहुत खूबसूरत और बहुत फेमस नज़म है कैफी आज़मी साहब की औरत, you know, and in that he says कि अपनी तारीख का उन्वान बदलना है तुझे, 
अपनी तारीख का उन्वान बदलना है तुझे हिज आस्किंग दिन दैट कि तुम खुद अपना टाइटल अपना जो शीर्षक है अपनी तारीख का अपने इतिहास का तुम खुद बदल सकती हो उठ मेरी जान मेरे साथ ही तक चलना है तुझे सो ऑन दैट नोट एंड ऑन दैट पॉजिटिव परस्पेक्टिव द काइंड ऑफ क्वेश्चन यू हैव पुट फॉर द काइंड ऑफ द इंक्वायरिंग एबिलिटी दी स्टूडेंट्स द काइंड ऑफ क्वेश्चन दैट आर कमिंग आई थिंक इट वॉज अ वंडरफुल डिस्कशन एंड प्रोफेसर त्यागी आई वुड कॉन्ग्रेचुलेट यू एंड थैंक यू for being so specific and so reference centric because it's very important for students to have reference for the ideas and for the studies that they want to pursue and i think in that context your presentation was wonderful and it was very rich thank you so much once again on behalf of everybody and i cannot thank less our dear principal sir professor gyantosh kumar jha who is always so supportive and open to the idea that uh, we all go to him with and he's always very supportive and thanks for him to taking time out and being here and professor tyagi thank you so much and uh, once again thank you for all the dear students who are here and we wish to see you more professor tyagi thank you so much for taking time out thank you so much thank you thank you so much it was my pleasure